Asia, and today uh, we're sort of spiraling further out of China to East Asia more broadly. Um, and we're ex really excited to have a series of three panels, and I'll introduce each speaker as we as we go. Um, first up is Kevin Pham, who's a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at the University of California, Riverside. And his work brings Vietnamese political thought to the fore in comparative political theory. Um, and we're very excited to have um, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. My, uh, this is a chapter from my dissertation. It's the fifth out of five chapters. And my dissertation explores a very exciting period in Vietnamese history, a period flowering with liberal ideas before communism became a predominant ideology in Vietnam. I look at five thinkers. And this paper is about the last thinker, Ho Chi Minh. And Ho Chi Minh is the story of how communism arrived in Vietnam. My paper specifically is about the impact of the 1919 Paris Peace Conference on Ho Chi Minh's political thought. If I say Ho Chi Minh, what do you think of? If you, if you are American, you probably think of America's enemy in the Vietnam War that took 58,000 Americans, the lives of 58,000 Americans and millions of Vietnamese. If you are Vietnamese, you probably think of a patriotic hero who led the Vietnamese in successful resistance against French colonialism and American imperialism. But if you are a Vietnamese, American or Vietnamese French or Vietnamese Australian who escaped Vietnam after the war, you might think of an evil communist dictator. So my family is on this side. My uncles fought in the war. And as a teenager, I'd ask them, what did you do in the Vietnam War? And they would proudly say, I killed communists. And one time when I was a teenager, I, had, I was reading Ho Chi Minh and I said to my dad, offhand remark, you know, Ho Chi Minh was just a patriot. He was a good guy. And later in the day, my dad took me aside, looked me in the eye, and he was so serious. And he said, don't you ever say Ho Chi Minh was a good guy. <laughs> Here's my dad, he turned his yellow Mustang into a Vietnamese flag, the South Vietnam flag. He went to a, a reunion in Southern California for Vietnam vets and they put his car in between two military vehicles, gave him VIP. In Southern California, there have been protests, thousands of Vietnamese Americans protesting this one video store, Vietnamese guy who put a poster of Ho Chi Minh in his store, and thousands of people came out into the streets and said, a few said they would put themselves on fire if, Ho, if this guy would, allow, would be allowed to have Ho Chi Minh's picture. So, but if you were an activist in 1968 in West Berlin with uh, other people from around the world, you thought that Ho Chi Minh was a hero and you marched with pictures of him chanting Ho 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 Chi Minh and weapons for the Viet Cong. There are many mixed emotions when people think of Ho Chi Minh, but what if we actually examined his life and his writings? My goal in this paper is not to defend Ho Chi Minh as a good guy or to demonize him. I'm a political theorist and I simply want to know about his political ideas how they evolved, and what political theorists can learn from all of this. Most scholars do not see him as a creative thinker. So there's a famous uh, biographer of Ho Chi Minh in Paris, uh, Pierre Brochu, and I was talking to him and I asked him, uh, est-ce que vous pensez que Ho Chi Minh était un penseur créatif? And he laughed and he said, pas du tout. No, he laughed. <laughs> Typically, scholars see him as taking a prepackaged Marxism and then just running with it, okay? It's true that Ho Chi Minh did not write systematic philosophy, but I'm going to show that he is creative, I think, and he was more than just a Marxist. So, what ideas, that's him writing, what ideas did he believe would bring the Vietnamese from oppression under French colonialism to freedom? What did he mean by freedom? I'm going to show that 
In 1919, Ho Chi Minh's political thought and consequently Vietnamese political thought shifted from liberalism to Marxism. Yet in his heart, Confucianism, uh, he saw he was a Confucian, and he saw Confucian self-cultivation as synonymous with Marxist revolution, and he still used liberal language. He envisioned as the goal a kind of liberal constitution, Marxist economy, and Confucian self-cultivation. I will start by making a challenge to David Marr, who says 1945 is the most important year in modern Vietnamese history. But I argue that in another way, <laughs> 1919 is more important. 1945 definitely was a dramatic year. The Vietnamese made a revolution, 80, ending five years of Japanese occupation, ending 80 years of French colonialism, ending thousands of years of dynastic politics and monarchist ideology, never to come back again. Very important year. However, 1919 was more important, I think, because it was a key turning point in the history of Vietnamese political thought. This was the year when liberalism was discredited in the eyes of Vietnamese thinkers and gave way to Marxism, which sowed the seeds for revolution in 1945. So what happened in 1919? I'm going to tell you the story, but I got to go back in time and go chronolo chronologically. Ho Chi Minh was born in 1890, and his father, was a Confucian scholar who, like other Vietnamese intellectuals, studied Confucian texts for the civil service exams, a tradition from China because China ruled Vietnam for a thousand years. Ho Chi Minh learned classical Confucianism as a child from his father. He grew up and in 1911, when he was a young man, he decided to get out of Vietnam and learn about the world. Why? Because he wanted to see what the world had to offer. So he just went to the port and he asked them for a job. He got a job as a mess boy on this uh, French ship and he would not return to Vietnam for 30 years. He would be abroad for 30 years. When he first arrived in France, he was so surprised and shocked when he was in a French cafe and a French waiter called him Monsieur. For the first time, he was treated as an equal. He was shocked. And he was like, what? The French in France are so nice, but the French in Vietnam are racist. And what this meant to him was that maybe human, humanity, human nature is naturally good. It's just the colonial system that makes people bad. He continued sailing around the world for six more years, and his boat stopped at ports in Africa, where he saw and described in his writing the abject misery of people living under European colonialism there. He visited the United States, where he described the mistreatment of African Americans and hypocrisy of Western civilization. Some of the stuff that he writes, I mean, he's describing a lynching in gruesome detail, and he's laughing at this notion of Western civilization. Well, this is unbelievable. Yet, he still believed in liberal reform. This is because his friend and close mentor was Phan Chu Trinh, who was old enough to be his father and who was very famous in Vietnam at the time for being a nationalist. Everybody knew who Phan Chu Trinh was. Nobody knew who Ho Chi Minh was. And Phan Chu Trinh believed in liberal democratic reform, and he believed that would make Vietnam strong. Some uh, shameless self-promotion. I have an article coming out in the Review of Politics that describes Phan Chu Trinh's Demo democratic Confucianism. He's Vietnam's first Democrat, and he saw it as the same thing as Confucian self-cultivation. Very interesting. So after traveling around the world, Ho Chi Minh lived in London for some time in poverty, doing menial labor, sweeping snow at a school eight hours a day. He would write letters to Phan Chu Trinh about how grueling the work was, and so he quit that job and he got another job, which was even worse, as a boiler operator. He says, from five o'clock, another friend and myself had to go to the basement to light the fire. All day long, we had to feed coal into the boiler. It was terrifying. I never knew what the people upstairs were, uh, were doing upstairs because I'd never been up there. It was terribly hot in the basement and terribly cold outside. I did not have enough warm clothes and therefore caught cold. So why am I talking about his work? Well, 
This is significant because the point is he's always been a manual laborer. He had no leisure time to sit and write theory and philosophy. He was not like Lenin or Mao who had long periods of comfort, safe protection where they could write revolutionary theory. No, he was a worker. He was constantly going hungry. And, but what this means is that there was still theory happening just because he didn't write it. In his head, there was still theory happening. You can see like a, a class consciousness developing. He's working for people who live upstairs. He can't see them. And so this probably made him more predisposed to radical politics, which we will soon see. In 1917, he arrives in war-torn France and works at a photo retoucher in a shop managed by Van Chu Chin, who was also living in France at the time. Then, in 1919, Paris Peace Conference, there Ho Chi Minh is inspired because it appears that Woodrow Wilson is uh, talking about self-determination for colonized peoples. Inspired by this, Ho Chi Minh and Fan Chu Chun and Fan Van Chung wrote a list of demands of the Vietnamese people and submitted them to the delegates of the conference on June 18. The demands were modest liberal rights, very modest. Number one, amnesty for political prisoners. Number two, equality under the law. Three, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of travel, freedom of education, rule of law, and representation. They did not ask for independence. In fact, at this time, Ho Chi Minh supported Albert Sarrault, who was the governor general in French Indochina. They signed it for the group of Vietnamese patriots, Nguyen Ai Quoc, which means Nguyen the Patriot, which is Ho Chi Minh's name at the time. The delegates ignored the demands. Edward House, or the, the advisor to uh, Wilson, uh, said thank you for the letter, and that's it. But from then on, appeal to liberal reform lost most of its credibility. The rejection at the Paris Peace Conference radicalized Ho Chi Minh. Shortly after, Ho Chi Minh moved in with Fan Chu Chen, Fan Van Chung uh, in 6 Villa de Goblin near Place d'Italie. I took this picture and I lived there for a while uh, next to them. And <laughs> from the perspective of the French, they were shocked and surprised. Who is this mysterious, audacious young Vietnamese guy who's writing this list of official sounding demands? And so they hired a Vietnamese informer. They hired police agents to stake out the residents and to follow Ho Chi Minh around Paris in 1919 and on and off until 1923. One police agent reported that one night at this house, there was an angry debate between Phan Chu Chin and Ho Chi Minh. Phan Chu Chin says, brother, quick, Allow me to observe, you are still very young and all can see that you are too headstrong. You want 20 million of our compatriots to do something when they have no weapons in their hands to oppose the fearsome weapons of the Europeans. Why should we commit suicide for no purpose? Ho Chi Minh responds, why don't our 20 million compatriots do anything to force the government to treat us as human beings. We are humans and we must live as humans. Anyone who does not want to treat us as his fellow man is our enemy. We don't want to live together with them on this earth. If others don't want to live with us as fellow humans, then it is really useless to live humiliating lives and be insulted on this earth. You are older and more experienced than I, but our compatriots have been demanding reforms for 60 years and have received what? very little. So what does Ho Chi Minh do? He's starting to break away from his mentor and he has ideas of his own. He takes the list of demands around Paris to different newspaper publishing houses, asking people to publish it. Everyone ignores him except Jean Langlais of the French Socialist Party, who happened to be Karl Marx's grandson. <laughs> And Jean Longuet is very warm and friendly to Ho Chi Minh. He says, yes, yes, I sympathize with you. Ho Chi Minh is like, wow, these people are, he's nice. So he starts joining uh, their meetings of the French socialists. He starts attending them. He's a very shy young man at first. He doesn't talk. His French is only developing. He's listening much more. And soon he's starting to catch on about this communist thing. He doesn't understand it, but he's listening. And eventually he starts asking them, look, you guys talk about oppressed peoples, but none of you are talking about the colonies. 
We in the colonies are oppressed. Why aren't you talking about that? He keeps bringing this up during the meetings. And then somebody at the meeting gives him a book that will change everything. They give him a copy of Lenin's theses on the national, uh -oh, uh, theses on the national and colonial questions. And Ho Chi Minh writes, in those theses, there were political terms that were difficult to understand, but by reading them again and again, finally, I was able to grasp the essential part. What emotion, enthusiasm, enlightenment, and confidence they communicated to me. I wept for joy. Sitting by myself in my room, I would shout as if I were addressing large crowds. Dear martyr compatriots, this is what we need. This is our path to liberation. Since then, I had entire confidence in Lenin in the Third International. So essentially, Lenin's thesis argued that the communists, in, the communist international should try to unite peasants and workers in all countries, in all lands, colonized or not. After a time of waiting and study, we realized that the Wilson Doctrine was but a big fraud. The liberation of the proletariat is the necessary condition for national liberation. Both these liberations can only come from communism and world revolution. So Ho Chi Minh starts publishing for articles for a journal, Le Pariah, saying that the Vietnamese must adopt Marxism-Leninism. And he starts smuggling copies of this journal into Vietnam using shoe boxes and stuff. This is how communism gets introduced into Vietnam. And meanwhile, in Vietnam, people are having like reading groups of reading about this. Communism's trickling in through the writings of Ho Chi Minh. One day, Ho Chi Minh receives a letter from Phan Thu Chen. Because of our disagreements, you have called me a conservative and backward scholar. I'm not the least bit angry about this label because I read French poorly and I cannot understand perfectly the works produced in this civilized land. I'm an exhausted horse who can no longer gallop. You are a fury stallion. But I'm sending this letter because I hope you will listen and prepare your grand design. From east to west, from antiquity to the present day, no one has acted as you have. In staying abroad on the pretext that your country is full of traps, to, to awaken the people so that our compatriots will engage in combat against the occupiers, it is indispensable to be there. Following your method, you have sent articles to the press here to incite our compatriots to mobilize their energy and spirit. But this is in vain. Because our compatriots cannot read French or even Quoc Nhu, which is Romanized Vietnamese, they are incapable of understanding your articles. So Ho Chi Minh leaves France, goes to Russia and China, trains to be a revolutionary for many years, finally returns to Vietnam in 1941 to lead the Vietnamese independence movement. In 1945, he gives the official declaration of independence of Vietnam. This is how it starts. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement appeared in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, it means all the peoples on the earth are equal from birth. All the peoples have a right to live and to be happy and free. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen made at this time of the French Revolution in 1791 also states all men are born free with equal rights and must always remain free and have equal rights. Those are undeniable truths. Here and for the rest of the speech, he, no mention of class struggle, Marxism. This is liberal language inspired by John Locke, America, and France. So the French still try to get back their colony. Uh, they're, they lost a lot of money in the war. They need money. They need their colony. So this prompts Vietnamese resistance and the first Indochina War. The French eventually lose in Dien Bien Phu in 1954. An American military presence comes in a year later and escalates the Vietnam War. Now, Throughout all these years of war, Ho Chi Minh starts emphasizing the value of Confucianism as the foundation in his revolutionary strategy. Ho Chi Minh said, to make a revolution, remold the soul first. To renovate the society, renovate the self first. Now today, all educated Chinese and Vietnamese know this famous saying from the Confucian book of great learning, cultivate the self, regulate one's family, and pacify the world. Ho Chi Minh was influenced by it. Ho Chi Minh says, to our Annam people, the Vietnamese, we should re self-rectify our mind by reading Confucius's works and with respect to revolution, read Lenin's works. French colonialism poisoned our people by alcohol and opium. They used any trick to corrupt our nation by bad habits like laziness, artfulness, embezzling, and others. It is our urgent responsibility to re-educate our people. We need to induce our people 
to become courageous, patriotic, and industrious people fit for the independent Vietnam. I suggest launching a campaign to re-educate the spirit of the people by practicing industriousness, thrift, honesty, and righteousness. These four virtues have their root in Confucian ethics. What's creative and interesting is that Ho Chi Minh saw the Marxist practice of criticism and self-criticism uh, developed by Stalin and used in the Khmer Rouge and elsewhere. And he saw it as synonymous with Confucian self-cultivation. So in summary, Ho Chi Minh's liberal demands are snubbed at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, which shifted liberal Vietnamese thought to Marxism, sowing the seeds for the 1945 revolution, the first Indochina War, and the Vietnam, Vietnam War with Americans. I don't think it's bold to claim that all of this could have been avoided if the delegates had responded differently. Here we have three, um, in addition to Marxism, he used liberal language and Confucianism in his revolutionary strategy. So here, we have three contrasting ideologies in one person. To use language from the Cold War, we had the ideology of the first world, liberalism for capitalist democracies, the second world, Marxism for communists, and the third world, in this case, Vietnam's Confucianism. Through Ho Chi Minh, we might see what a conversation might look like between these three ideologies. Now, it's been argued that Western liberalism is rooted in Christianity by several political theorists. If so, we can see Ho Chi Minh discuss these three ideologies in this quote, which I will leave you with. The advantage of Confucius's doctrine is the moral cultivation of individuals. The advantage of Jesus's religion is the great altruism. The advantage of Marxism is the dialectic method of work. The advantage of Sun Yat-sen's doctrine <laughs> is that its principles were appropriate to our condition. Confucius, Jesus, Marx, and Sun Yat-sen share commonalities. They all pursue the happiness of mankind and the welfare of society. If they were alive and gathered in one place, I believe that they would coexist perfectly like amicable friends. I try to be their tiny student. Thank you. Thanks so much for that real, really creative way of rereading Ho Chi Minh. Um, <laughs> next up is uh, Karen, who. Uh, uh, who is a assistant professor in East Asian history at the College of the Holy, Cro Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. He's currently preparing a book manuscript titled Fin de Siècle uh, Diplomat, Chen Jitong and Cosmopolitan Possibilities in the Late Qing World, uh, which is about a Chinese writer diplomat who became a cultural celebrity in late 19th century Paris. He is also uh, researching Chinese transnational activism in the 1930s and during the global Second World War. His latest publication is The International Peace Campaign, China and Transnational Activism at the Outset of World War II, which is, which, uh, was, is collected in the Routledge History of World Peace since 1750. <coughs> okay. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Albert, uh, for that introduction. Thank you and to you and Stephen for organizing this uh, wonderful conference. I would also like to thank my fellow China historians um, who brilliantly yesterday laid out all the background and context for the Chinese experience of 1919, the May 4th, May 4th movement, all the dynamic, diverse, and even diasporic uh, dimensions uh, of that. So I don't have to talk too much about, about that. Uh, and I think Tsuki is uh, going to do more later on for us today. Uh, and but the presentations yesterday on China have really shown the significance of 1919 um, as both a turning point and as a frame of reference for uh, not only China's diplomatic situation in, in that period, but also modern Chinese social, cultural, and intellectual history um, as a whole. Um, my presentation today is not on uh, young Chinese would-be communists like Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, and so on, who were also present in Paris and Lyon and had uh, uh, Marilyn Levine uh, famously called them the found generation, thinking of some um, lost Americans during the same period. Uh, but uh, on another group, which is the uh, a group of Chinese intellectuals and sometimes bureaucrats who, um, instead of rejecting um, sort of wholesale Wilsonianism, um, came to uh, 
embrace in the wake of uh, Versailles um, the liberal internationalist order and also to use that framework um, to uh, help uh, to make a place for China in this new world order uh, that we've been talking about to help fellow Chinese make sense of their place in this new world. Um, and by the 1930s, so in going into uh, a couple of decades into the interwar period, uh, to confront China's national crisis in uh, the face of Japanese aggression through an internationalist uh, framework and discourse. Um, and so uh, by talking about the Chinese League of Nations Union, uh, this international society, I am engaging with some of the points raised already yesterday on the intertwining of nationalism and cosmopolitanism, the emergence of public opinion and the importance of journals in the mass press, the organizing of um, transnational networks and, um, and communities, uh, both in China at the local, but also uh, at the global, uh, both at the local and also at the global levels. Um, as Jeff uh, pointed out yesterday, uh, 1919 in China could be interpreted by both looking backward and looking forward. So in this paper, I looked forward into the interwar period, 1919 to 1939, although interwar for China is tricky because if you begin with the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, that's 1931. Uh, and uh, there's a case to be made for a longer term global World War II uh, if we uh, think about that periodization. But we can talk about 1939. Uh, here today. Um, and so it's not really focusing on uh, Chinese responses to the Treaty of Versailles or Chinese disenchantment with Wilsonianism, which has, you know, by, by now is a familiar story to all of us. Um, I'm going to look at a dimension of China's continued engagement with the League of Nations uh, and with the League of Nations style internationalism uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, that said, uh, I would still like to briefly begin with a uh, colorful figure uh, who, amazingly enough, has not been mentioned yet uh, at this conference, uh, Wellington Ku, uh, who is probably familiar to uh, other people, even if you're not China specialists, uh, from Margaret Macmillan's Paris 1919, from Eris Manella's, well, so he's the, the, the figure, right, who stands in for China, who stands up for China, who give, delivers the cradle of civilization uh, speech, Shandong is our Jerusalem kind of uh, uh, rhetoric, um, and uh, is the very young, 31 years old. Um, uh, I'm half a decade older than him. Uh, a Chinese minister to Washington, who is uh, not the leading delegate at Versailles, but uh, becomes kind of the spokesperson for the, the, the group. Um, and uh, of course, the story of Ku has been told in such a way as to represent the, uh, as Peter noted yesterday, the dashed hopes right, of the Chinese delegation um, at Versailles. Um, in uh, Erez Manella's words, uh, the Chinese did not sign uh, the Treaty of Versailles. They left empty chairs at, at Versailles. Um, but the, the interesting thing to know, note about Wellington Ku, and he's, you know, along with many others uh, that I'll try to talk about a little bit today, um, is that Ku, his background, um, if, uh, if you're not familiar, um, he was a political scientist. He's listed uh, in this map is Dr. Wellington Ku uh, with an education, Americanized education from St. John's University in, in Shanghai, Columbia University. He wrote a dissertation on extraterritoriality, the status of aliens uh, in, in China. And he doesn't, he rejects the treaty, but he doesn't reject the internationalist order. Uh, and he, a case can be made that the Chinese uh, delegates, diplomats, and uh, civic activists um, walked out of Versailles, but straight into the League of Nations. Uh, so this is the Chinese delegation at the, uh, in Geneva in 1920. Um, so I w w want to make sure that this is a part of the story that, that also is told in thinking about the legacy um, of the Paris Peace Conference for China. Um, my paper, though, is not so much about um, China's interactions with the League of, Na uh, League of Nations, per se. That's been covered uh, a little bit in recent years. There's been a proliferation of studies on the League of Nations um, around the world. For China, a lot of the uh, focus in, in a spate of really nice articles has been on uh, issues such as technical and scientific cooperation, uh, the role of League of Nations advisors and engineers in Nanjing, uh, the um, economic development and, and discourse. Um, and so that's been kind of the focus uh, along with issues of, of diplomacy. Um, but what about um, as some of the papers uh, uh, have been focusing on uh, at this conference, the um, non-state, right, or, or, or not uh, 
the formal diplomatic level uh, and transnational level. Um, one organization uh, that uh, appeared actually before or, or during the Paris Peace Conference um, was the Chinese League of Nations Union, which had branches in Beijing, Geneva, and Paris, uh, and eventually uh, in the 1930s in the various wartime capitals China had in Nanjing, Hankou, and, and Chongqing. Uh, and between these years, they had a membership of about over 3,000. Um, they promoted the causes of international peace, collective security, elucidated political affairs in Asia, uh, East Asia for a European audience. Um, and uh, I, uh, it's, uh, it's not as much of a volunteerist association as the more famous British League of Nations Union as uh, well studied by Helen McCarthy. But nevertheless, um, I would argue that it represents a significant instance of a non-European intellectual and internationalist movement um, uh, and embrace of this uh, kind of legacy in the interwar period. So uh, due to time considerations, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the origins of both the uh, initial organization of the uh, Chinese League of Nations Union in 1919, um, the uh, interwar reinvention, reorganization of this uh, group, and uh, bring up a couple examples of the kind of, of publications and activities that uh, the, uh, this organization um, uh, participated in and produced. In January of, uh, late January of 1919, during the first weeks uh, of the Paris uh, Conference, um, representatives of League societies were, were gathering also um, uh, in Paris, uh, including those from Britain, from the US, from Italy, Belgium, but also those from China. Um, and they created what would become the International Federation of League of Nations Societies. Uh, and there was a com direct communication from the Chinese delegates in Paris to the, uh, the group that Spassian mentioned yesterday, the Citizen Dip Diplomatic Society uh, in China, uh, asking for uh, Chinese activists to organize uh, support for the League of Nations. So a meeting was held uh, in February in Beijing at the home of uh, Xiong Xiling, pictured here, uh, who uh, was a former minister in the Republic, an educator and philanthropist, one of the um, elderly elites who would become the head and first president of the Chinese League of Nations Union. Um, this initial gathering was also attended by both former and current officials and diplomats, in addition to several leading academics, including uh, famous professors uh, from Beijing University, who, uh, such as Hu Shu, who were part of the May 4th uh, sort of uh, period. Um, and this is a signal that this organization would always have kind of two phases, one kind of bureaucratic state sponsor, state-led, even though it claim to be non-government, but also an intellectual. So I see it as also an intellectual project as, as, as well. Another characteristic of the Chinese League of Nations Union is its consistent use of the press uh, and awareness of the importance of public opinion, both to influence Chinese at home, but also uh, uh, foreigners uh, abroad. Um, so immediately following the meeting, um, a manifesto was penned by Xiong Xiling and published in several leading newspapers in China. And in this declaration, Xiong and other founding members of the Chinese League of Nations Union um, declared that they echoed the need for the creation not only of the, of the League, but also of National League of Nations societies to support uh, this, this effort. Um, and they claimed that China was you know, essentially a, a peaceful nation, um, and it would embrace this. Uh, models uh, in Great Britain, the League, uh, the League of Nations Union in Great Britain, League to Enforce Peace in the US, the Association Francaise pour les Sociétés des Nations in, in Paris. These were all claimed as models, but they're really contemporaries. They all kind of rose around the same time um, for uh, this uh, Chinese society. Um, in this declaration, Xiong also remarked uh, that um, to prevent uh, and I see this as more significant, uh, uh, to prevent the League of Nations from becoming a tool of the strong powers, the Qiangquan that was raised yesterday, um, the, uh, there needs to be some sort of monitoring, some sort of supervision from public opinion, popular opin opinion around the world. So that, um, as he writes, once the League is formed, it must not act arbitrarily. It should be monitored by worldwide public opinion uh, so it doesn't become biased, uh, aided so it does not become weakened, and uh, so that it would support the development of international friendship. He also noted that the establishment of the League of Nations Union in China 
um, would serve the purpose of not only supporting the League of Nations as an organization, but really to help communicate and to mutually support other societies. In other words, uh, in, to reach the ideal, the late Qing or late 19th century, early 20th century Chinese ideal of that, uh, on the great unity, the cosmopolitanism um, that uh, Peter alluded to uh, yesterday as well. And we see this kind of cosmopolitan idealism um, in the key figures who were uh, part of the, the founding members uh, of the League of Nations Union. These are all very famous figures in um, the story of Chinese intellectual and cultural history. So the radical-minded educator uh, and anarchist uh, Cai Yuanpei, um, the reformer and journalist Liang Qichao, who came then to Brussels and Paris in 1989 to observe the Paris Keeps Conference, but also to be the delegate at the International Federation of League of Nations Societies for China. Uh, Lin Changmin, who uh, is, uh, was a well-known constitutional scholar who represented the Chinese League of Nations in future uh, meetings in Europe. He's perhaps more famously known, uh, known as the father of the uh, poet uh, Lin Huiyin. Uh, and um, so this is, this is the, the group uh, that got this uh, society started in 1919. Um, the Chinese League of Nations Union um, would support and interact with the official Chinese League of Nations delegation throughout the 1920s. Um, and as they worked on issues such as the uh, revisiting the uh, tariff autonomy, extraterritoriality uh, for China in 1925, um, the uh, advocacy of a uh, seat for China on the League of Nations Council uh, in the mid 1920s as well. But um, because of chaotic politics in China, uh, so going back to the domestic context, uh, in the mid-1920s, uh, uh, followed um, and suppression of student movements uh, by the warlords, the uh, national revolution fought by the nationalists and communists uh, in 1927-28, um, as well as the deaths of some of these leading figures, um, the Chinese League of Union f fell into a little bit of a, a lapse in the late 1920s uh, until uh, a national, new national crisis came up, and that was the Japanese aggression and invasion uh, in Manchuria, so around 1931. Uh, and this is a time when, uh, for that decade at least, uh, the Chinese Republic had a more or less stable government, uh, the nationalist uh, or Kuomintang-led government in Nanjing, uh, headed by Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and um, it's at this point where we see uh, a reinvention or reorganization and reinvigoration, really, of the League of Nations, uh, Chinese League of Nations, Union. Um, this is a uh, list of the, the, uh, the officers and board of directors, um, and uh, it's difficult to tell, but there are a number of uh, bureaucrats as well as uh, longtime diplomats, Wellington Ku, you see his name on here, as well as some leading intellectuals. Some of them occupied multiple uh, 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 roles. Uh, for, for instance, uh, Zhu Jiahua, uh, who uh, was a geologist with a PhD from Berlin, was the Minister of Communication, was the president of the Academic Syndicate, the official kind of think tank, uh, which still exists today uh, in Taiwan, um, uh, and appointed to be the Chinese League of Nations uh, Union president in 1936. So he was wearing all these, he was an intellectual bureaucrat in, in this sense. Um, he would go on. Uh, one of the things I, I, I would like to raise is the idea of continuity. So he would be also the head of the Chinese delegation at UNESCO after the war, after the Second World War. What were the goals uh, of this reinvigorated interwar League of Nations Union in China? Uh, there were sort of two sides that they were working on. One was the international, which is to promote cooperation, mutual understanding among nations, to preserve, this is the language uh, that was used in its uh, charter in 1936, revised charter, to preserve human justice and peace. Um, and its activities included uh, participation in all kinds of a civic uh, society uh, activity uh, abroad, um, giving statements and responses to key international uh, issues, publication of foreign language material to introduce developments um, in Chinese uh, politics, economy, society, and culture, hosting foreign visitors to China, including League of Nations personnel, but also other foreign visitors, establishing uh, society branches in key cities abroad. Um, in for at the domestic level, um, the idea was to keep on telling Chinese people that the League of Nations was a useful thing, it was a good thing, uh, and also to uh, really, through that, explain something about China's position um, in, in the world. Uh, but interestingly, also, uh, 
China's responsibility in preserving world peace. So it's not just for China, it's for the world as well. And I think that's very important that, that this language continues to be used. Uh, and the kind of uh, activities also included going down to uh, a much lower level. So middle schools, uh, they would try to organize League of Nations weeks, propaganda weeks to, to tell kids about the League of Nations. Um, there's a great number of publications, which as a work in progress, I'm still trying to work through. Um, but we talked about pamphlets yesterday. There was a good number of series of pamphlets on uh, Far Eastern Affairs, Sino-Japanese issues. Uh, of course, a lot of this is in the wake of the Lytton Commission in 1931, uh, which frustrated many Chinese. But again, they did not give up the League of Nations. Right? This is, of course, against the conventional idea that after Manchuria, League of Nations stopped working for China in some way. Um, many different journals in both Chinese and English. Uh, a, a monthly uh, review of international politics, Politique Mondiale, but it was really published in Chinese. A uh, English publication called China Forum, uh, which interestingly included not only um, reports on uh, League of Nations activity, League of Nations visits, for example, the Anti-Epidemic Commission visits China, they'll have a report about that. Um, the report uh, during the early months of the Japanese uh, invasion of China, League of Nations uh, buildings that were um, uh, bombed, or sponsored enterprises that were uh, bombarded uh, in uh, China. Um, some examples here. Uh, but also, interestingly, some, uh, providing a comparative perspective. So on the left, you see uh, the bombarding of Canton. But on the right, it's the, it's the same kind of horror visited upon Spain. And again, this is the internationalist framework that this um, group is working through. There are many articles published in these various publications on China and uh, world peace, China and collective security, the idea of Chinese uh, pacifism, um, as well as critiques. Uh, Oh, sorry, uh, critiques of U.S. and British uh, isolationism. Uh, this is still before uh, September in 1939 and uh, also before Pearl Harbor, obviously. Um, the League of Nations Union in China also sponsored um, various kinds of goodwill activities. So uh, in 1938, when the Chinese uh, government had to move to, to Hong Kong, they sponsored a goodwill um, uh, the conference of children, uh, Chinese and foreign children together uh, uh, against fascism right, uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, as well as World Youth Conferences in 1938, uh, 36 and 38. Um, towards the end, uh, towards later in, in the war, 1940, uh, the, the publications seem to be more state sponsored, in the, as far as I've uh, read, um, and to be more sort of, there's a lot of uh, propaganda in service of Chiang Kai-shek, Madam Chiang Kai-shek, um, and uh, it seems to be, the League of Nations Union seems to be caught up in the war time effort. So less um, civic activism and more mobilization. Um, but uh, this uh, very long time, sort of two decade effort at uh, preserving, continuing uh, this civic association, I think is something significant. Um, and. Uh, if uh, we think about China and the story of China's internationalization, a lot of it has been told through this moment in 1919. So uh, if, if you read uh, Xu Guoqi's uh, writings on China in the Great, war, war, Great World War, uh, Great War, or Chinese workers on the Western Front, he makes an argument about that moment, uh, the Great War being China's moment of internationalization. But again, uh, going back to what Jeff said, we can think about um, the late Qing, the late 19th century. Um, I, in my book, I write about Chinese diplomats on the world stage in the 1880s and 1890s, international congresses, uh, and of course, going forwards as well. So an example would be the League of Nations Union. Another example, which I won't talk about uh, t today, but it's the International Peace Campaign, which also had a presence in anti-fascist movement in the 1930s, also had a presence in China. They also claimed to uphold the, uh, uh, the treaty, the covenant, the collective security principles. They held a big conference in London in support of China, condemnation of Japanese uh, bombardment in China. Um, and so together, these groups, um, uh, I think, bring to mind the idea of this continuity and the legacy of a embrace or a continued engagement uh, with the League of Nations uh, and with uh, this internationalist uh, idea, which obviously carries on. This is Wallachian Ku again, uh, some years later, uh, preparing for a speech at the League, uh, United Nations. Uh, and the Chinese League of Nations Union at this time is the new, by 1945-46,
uh, United Nations Society in China. Thank you. Thank you for that paper. I think it blends quite nicely with Kevin's about the sort of enduring power of liberalism in Asia. Um, and the next speaker will be Thomas Berkman, uh, who has devoted much of, of his career as a Japanese historian to research on Japan's dealing with the League of Nations from its inception through Japan's departure in 1933. Uh, he is the author of Japan and the League of Nations Empire and World Order, 1914 to 1938. And that came out with the uh, University of Hawaii Press in 2008. I'd like to commend the organizers of this conference and the, uh, the American University of Paris for allowing us to present our ideas before a informed and enthusiastic audience. In 1919, a June wedding took place. In the Hall of Mirrors, Uncle Sam, with clerical dignity, intoned the marriage covenant. In the company of 40 other states, Japan was enjoined to the League of Nations. It was an arranged marriage fraught with conflict from the first encounter. Japan was unhappy with the nuptial contract and had threatened to break the engagement a few weeks before the ceremony. Though most Japanese were proud of the status achieved by tying into a prominent family, others had to hold their tongues when the minister asked any who objected to the union to show cause. One neighbor, the Soviet Union, was not invited to the wedding, and another, China, canceled out just before the rite. Most disconcerting at all, of all, shortly after administering the vows, the minister left the faith. <laughs> the Empire of Japan took its seat at the table of the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 as one of the big five nations at the parlay. That is the United States, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. Japan's rocky courtship of the League of Nations through the conference was dominated by disagreements over the evolving covenant and impacted Japan's territorial claims and its project for racial non-discrimination. This paper will explicate and analyze Japan's dealing with League of Nations problems at Paris in 1919 with special attention to the regional concerns that dominated the nation's agenda. Let us first clarify Japan's position among the leading nations of the world in 1919. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, Imperial Japan was a regional power. Japan lacked world power capabilities and status that are sometimes mistakenly accorded Japan after its victory over Imperial Russia in 1905. Japan's ability to mount successful military campaigns was limited to the region of East Asia. Its refusal during the Great War to commit ground troops and warships to the battlegrounds of Europe is evidence of Japan's self-consciousness of the regional confines of its ability to wage war. But though a middle power, Japan had aspirations to expand its regional dominance and thereby elevate world status. As an aspiring middle power, Japan viewed any institutionalization of the status quo order as unfair and detrimental to the legitimate natural development of a nation's position in Asia and the world. Japan arrived at Paris clearly, clearly unprepared on the question of the League of Nations, which turned out to be the first agenda item of the meeting. The massive citizen movements in Europe in support of a League of Nations had no counterpart in Japan. Up until the armistice, the Japanese foreign ministry had dismissed allied leaders' proposals for an association of nations as wartime rhetoric and had not even settled on an official Japanese language rendering for League of Nations. <laughs> 
when the Peace Conference planning potentiaries settled at the Hotel Bristol in January, Japan alone among the big five had not formulated a draft constitution for the League. As the Japanese public became aware of the League concept, opinions expressed in the press at home were generally favorable to the establishment of a League and solicitous of Japan's participation. The middle power impulse to follow world trends was evident. Nonetheless, misgivings emerged in the public discussion. One was discomfort with the shift from bilateral diplomacy, through which Japan had achieved noteworthy successes in the Meiji period, and particularly with China during the Great War, to the multilateral diplomacy envisioned for the League of Nations. The imposition of a status quo order upon Japan was a source of apprehension on the part of policymakers and opinion leaders alike. The status quo underpinnings of the League represented a fundamental challenge to Japanese aspirations to achieve major powerhood through predominance in East Asia. This fear was voiced in the Diplomatic Advisory Council, or Gaiko Sakai, by the Council's most outspoken member, Ito Myoji, pictured here on the left. Uh, Ito was a cantankerous personality. Uh, we would expect from him some opposition to the League of Nations. A uh, prominent Japanese uh, journalist, Baba Tsunego, uh, likened Ito to the 300 bonsai that decorated his garden, saying that the gnarled trees were a parallel to his stunted personality. <laughs> Ito asked whether the impossible ideals of President Wilson were a reliable substitute for the Anglo-Japanese alliance as a foundation for Japan's national security. The proposed league, Ito argued, would be an international political union to preserve the status quo for the Anglo-Saxon race and check the ascendancy of other powers. Another note noteworthy figure pictured on the right who portrayed the League as an unwelcome constraint was Konoe Fumimaro, a young scion of the imperial family, uh, aide to Chief Paris Conference plenipotentiary Sionji Kimochi, and future Prime Minister. On the eve of Konoe's departure for Europe, he published a diatribe in the popular nationalist magazine Nihon Oyobi Nihonjin, or Japan and the Japanese, entitled, I Reject Anglo-American Pacifism. He contended that the world order projected by the Euro-American victors of the war had nothing at all to do with justice, but rather was a cover for major powers monopoly, monopolizing the natural resources of the world. The Anglo-Saxons, argued Konoe, were moving under the guise of the League and arms limitation to impose upon late developing nations a status quo designed to perpetuate their own dominance. Konoe warned that unless the peace conference recognized racial equality and opened all colonies to free trade, Japan might someday be compelled, like Imperial Germany, to break loose from its confinement. Not all Japanese evaluated the League concept as injurious to Japan. Liberal intellectuals of the Taisho democracy movement praised the proposals by Wilson and other Entente leaders as heralds of a new world order and models for progressive change in Japan's government and society. Yoshino Sakuzo, a professor of political science at Tokyo University, spoke in the leading intellectual journal, Chuo Kodon, of the pressing need for an international union. Within the foreign ministry, an influential Ebeha, or Anglo-American faction, counseled that Japan should make cordial relations with the two world powers the primary goal of foreign policy. Among its members was Makino Nobuaki, a former foreign minister and ambassador to Rome and Vienna. Uh, 
Machina was appointed second in command to Sionji as a Paris Peace Conference plenipotentiary and was the delegate's major spokesman in the League of Nations Commission. Before the Diplomatic Advisory Council, Machino made clear his conviction that the League movement reflected world trends of pacifism and internationalism and that Japan should give the organization unqualified support. Japan's non-participation, he warned, might result in an ostracism from world economic and diplomatic communities and provoke global sympathy for China. The impulse to, to conform to world trends, known as Taisei Junno, a very prominent uh, notion within the foreign ministry at the time, was also dominant in the cabinet headed by Hara Takashi of the Seiyukai party, pictured on the left. Prime Minister Hara had built his career forging compromises with military hardliners and policy progressives. Uchida Yasuya, his foreign minister, pictured on the right, was equally flexible. His nickname was Gomu Ningyo, or Rubber Doll, because he could bend in any direction. The Seiyukai party was backed by business interests enriched by wartime exports to the Allies, for whom continued cordial trade relations with the major powers was a high priority. When the peace conference opened, the cabinet instructed the plenipotentiaries to delay the formation of the proposed League of Nations, but not to stand alone outside if the League came to fruition. Japan's primary goals for the Paris Peace Conference centered on the displacement of German power in East Asia. They're well known to secure the acquisition of former German Pacific islands north of the equator uh, to receive the uh, leasehold of Shandong province centered on the port of Qingdao in China. And later they added the demand for a statement in the League of Nations Covenant of Racial Non-Discrimination. Contrary to the pre-conference expectations of most Japanese political policy, most Japanese policymakers, each of Japan's primary goals was to become inextricably intertwined with the issue of the League of Nations during the course of the negotiations. An analysis of these negotiations reveals Japan's prioritization of regional order. To focus on regional empowerment at a multilateral parley where a global monitoring system headed by headed the agenda was no easy task. So now let us look at two subjects to which Japan devoted concentrated effort to preserve and enhance regional prerogatives. The first is disarmament. The 14 points that signal Wilson's intention to press the cause of disarmament in the post-war settlement. By the time the Japanese mission arrived in Paris, the principle of disarmament had been firmly set in the draft covenants. It worried them that the disarmament item in the covenant had ballooned to encompass provisos to abolish conscription and private arms manufacture and to require the, quote, full and frank interchange, unquote, of information on national armaments and military programs. Fortunately for the Japanese delegation, other middle powers were vitally concerned about Article 8 of the Hurst-Miller draft. Italian objections before the conference opened had already made the inclusion of a ban on conscription doubtful and the French took up the gauntlet in the fourth meeting of the League of Nations Commission. There, Léon Bourgeois argued that to the French, compulsory military service was a fund fundamental component of democracy. President Wilson agreed to strike this provision from the covenant. It was the French delegation again which carried the ball on an amendment, much in Japan's interest, to tailor disarmament requirements to the specific geographical circumstances of member states. Having in mind France's proximity to a potentially resurgent Germany, the venerable Monsieur Bourgeois on 11 February introduced the following amendment to Article 8. Quote, 
having due regard in determining the number of troops, not only to the rel relative strength of the different states, but also to the risks to which they are exposed by their geographical situation and the nature of their frontiers. A drafting committee simplified the wording to read, quote, taking account of the geographical situation and circumstances of each state, unquote, and the commission adopted it on 13 February. The French amendment recognizing the relevance of geographical circumstances in disarmament may have provided a model for subsequent Japanese efforts to inject the issue of geography into covenant provisions on sanctions. Uh, you may also know of the rather well-known change in the covenant uh, brought about by a Japanese amendment in defining the scope of uh, or the uh, principle of disarmament. Uh, that is, it origi originally stated in the draft covenants that this would be in line with uh, domestic uh, security, and the Japanese changed that to national security, and that was adopted by the League of Nations Commission, greatly expanding the scope of, of armaments permissible under League of Nations disarmament programs. The second major issue where the Japanese played a role and emphasized regional needs was in sanctions. The sanctions provisions of the 10th and 16th articles of the February 14 draft covenant were ranked by the Japanese delegation with disarmament as items most disadvantaged, disadvantageous to Japan. In their maneuvering to, to neutralize Article 16, the Japanese applied the principle of special geographical circumstances which the French had successfully inserted in Article 8 on disarmament. The delegation, the Japanese delegation, drew up the following amendment for insertion at the end of the article. Quote, responsibility as to the measures to be taken under this article shall upon geographical and political considerations rest largely and primarily with a state member of the league which is situated near the covenant breaking state against whom the measures are directed. Japan had a deep fear that the League of Nations would act as a conduit for bringing European and North American imperial power into East Asia. And so the object of this uh, draft amendment uh, was to limit uh, sanctions operations to states within the area of that offending state. Uh, because the sanctions items were, were viewed by the uh, leading states as essential to the success of the League of Nations and its, its uh, ability to, uh, uh, to enforce peace. Uh, the Japanese amendment, amendment never made it into the covenant. But the evidence in the archives uh, of these amendments show the intention uh, and the will of the Japanese to limit sanctions measures to uh, regional states. Article 10 of the Covenant guaranteed members territorial integrity and empowered the League Council to advise measures to combat acts of aggression. The Japanese delegates drafted amendments again, which if enacted would have significantly qualified the concept of aggression set forth in the Covenant. Like the Japanese amendments for Article 16, the statements composed by the mission would have recognized special regional relationships and obligations. And I quote from one of these draft amendments, and the executive council shall in this connection give due consideration to circumstances arriving from geographical relations of states members of the league. Given Japan's concern for special geographical circumstances and singular relationships, it is no surprise that the delegation took a deep interest in the American proposal of 10 April that the covenant affirmed the validity of, quote, regional understandings like the Monroe Doctrine, unquote. It is also no surprise that the Chinese delegation suspected Japan's motives. <clears throat> 
Makino and Chinda, Japanese plenipotentiaries, met privately with Colonel House to assure him of their warm support. Colonel Stephen Bonsall, an assistant to House, commented to the Japanese visitors that the provision confers upon the Japanese much the same guardianship over East Asia as that we asserted over Latin America in the days of the Holy Alliance. China's Wellington coup, whom you saw on the screen in the previous presentation, threatened in vain that his government might refuse to sign the covenant if this provision was not restricted to the actual Monroe Doctrine. In the end, this broadly construed protection of regional understandings was set in the covenant. The Monroe Doctrine Reservation was regarded by the plenipotentiaries of Japan as tacit acceptance of the empire's special regional interests. So moving beyond the conference, uh, I conclude with some comments on Japan's continuing regional emphasis during its life in the League of Nations. Japan was an upstanding member of the League until it left in 1933 uh, over the Manchurian incident. Throughout the 1920s, Japan found the League to be no barrier to the growth of Japanese economic, economic penetration and political influence on the East Asian mainland, so long as Japan's regional predominance was acted out by nonviolent means. Japan tried conscientiously to achieve its regional goals within the world order framework of the League of Nations. But there is evidence of some change throughout the 1920s, and the Locarno Pact is one benchmark in that change. Uh, when the uh, when the Locarno Pact uh, took place in 1925, Japan's uh, representative on the League of Nations Council spoke before the Council saying that it would be best to confine the task of the League of Nations for the moment to the establishment of regional agreements to extend these regional agreements as far as circumstances permitted to other parts of the world. It is hoped that this agreement will serve as a valuable mode for other regional agreements of the same character in other parts of the globe. And then back in Japan, this same Ishii Kikujudo suggested that Japan's often fractious relations with China be resolved through a, quote, Pacific Locarno. So in the 1930s, after Japan had exited the League of Nations, uh, Japan sought to fill the vacuum of diplomatic isolation by proposing a number of regional order agreements in East Asia. Uh, these included a Locarno Pact for the Far East, a Security Pact of the Pacific, a Greater Asian Federation, and a Far Eastern League of Nations. The final framework was the new order in East Asia, instigated by Prime Minister Konoe Fumimado in 1938. Do you remember Konoe from a few minutes ago? Konoe, now as premier in his, in his public announcement, made it clear that the new order in East Asia was meant to replace the irra irrational principles of the League of Nations. In conclusion, when viewed from the vantage point of Japanese realist. The League of Nations is, as constructed at the Paris Peace Conference, was a scheme to integrate East Asia into a rational global system whereby multilateral constraints would be imposed upon Japan's local prerogatives. In response to this specter, Japan displayed a paradoxical mixture of internationalist idealism and regionalist proclivities. On the one hand, Japan was attracted to the potential enhancement of its international image that would accompany participation in a global peace structure as one of the big five. On the other, Japanese efforts at the Paris Peace Conference to insert provisions to limit the exercise of League members' obligations to their immediate vicinity concretely reveal the local priorities of Japan's own diplomatic program. <clears throat> 
In any case, Japan at Paris was not a silent partner of the peace. As an aspiring middle power seeking to achieve its destiny in a world dominated by first-class powers, Japan took forthright steps to assure its predominance within its own geographical sphere. Japan judged that heightened status vis-a-vis -vis the powers could be reached only if the routes to predominance in Asia were held open. So thank you again for three really interesting and s stimulating papers. Um, I guess I won't comment that much just other than this, it seems like this thread of uh, both the dashed hopes of 1919, but also sort of the promises of them continue to reverberate in different ways in uh, different parts of Asia. And maybe that's something we can tease out more in the discussion. So I'll just open it up uh, to Peter Zero. So I guess you know um, Liu Xiaoqi's Chinese book on how to be a good communist. The literal title should be self-cultivation of communism. That's not my question. My question <laughs> is, okay, we can all, I think, maybe empathize with Ho Chi Minh's desire to have a nice sit down and a cup of tea with Confucius and Marx and maybe Rousseau or, or whoever. But I'm, I'm guessing, I guess, as, as a political theorist, you might want to suggest that we could have a useful sit down with Ho Chi Minh and learn something, not, not just sort of study it historically. Um, can, I, can I push you in that direction? I couldn't do that with my parents. <laughs> I couldn't do that with my uncles. I, I, I'm, I could probably do that with the younger generation. Yeah, and I totally agree. And so I think we can learn something from them, but uh, there's just so much emotion. I mean, there were pictures of him next to Hitler, uh, the South, Viet the the Vietnamese Americans in those protests. Like I couldn't do that now. I could never. Actually, I don't think if I gave the same presentation to the Vietnamese community, eh, I don't think it would be good. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. That's my goal. That's my goal, yeah. That's what I'm doing. Thank you, Saul, Harry, with a hand Can I just follow, it's just related to that. Um, just to push you uh, just even more, particularly, <laughs> sorry. I, I find this really important matter. If, um, I was thinking when you were talking about um, about an, another uh, individual who has been constantly said, you know, it's not a, he's not a real Marxist, um, Tan Malaka, who is the, the first Indonesian communist um, a representative at the common turn whose ideas um, were were creative and um, or original in the way that has been denied to many Asian Marxists and I think actually to um, to to characterize Ho Chi Minh as somebody who sort of randomly pulled together things like liberalism and Marxism to assume that there is a thing called Marxism on which Ho, Ho Chi Minh could randomly draw and say, well, I'm going to take a bit of that, is to kind of do disservice to the sort of intellectual work that these people are doing in the particular sociological circumstances that they are thinking through, um, things like what Marxism is prescribing for Europe that clearly have no purchase on what, on what people like Tan Malaka and Ho Chi Minh are experiencing. And so I, I, it, the, this is, it's, it's quite an important push, I think, to, uh, particularly as a political theorist, to take these people seriously on, on their historical terms and not to call them as kind of bricoleurs who just have chats with like Sun Yat-sen and, and Rousseau and so forth. It's, I think it's quite an important move. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, for these wonderful papers. Um, one thing I was thinking about, and this also bridges with the other panel we had, is that there's a very interesting and delicate relationship between power, law, and legitimacy, right? Raw power without law is illegitimate. It, 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 it leads, it led to the things we saw in the 1930s and 40s. That said, le legality without power, you know, is, is also hollow, right? And one of the things that I find so interesting about the League of Nations, and particularly the, the Versailles Treaty as well, is that there were uh, provisions such as, for example, the exemption of the Monroe Doctrine, 
that, that created something what George Orwell, would, or George Orwell would describe as, you know, some parties to it as being more equal than others, right? Uh, having these regional prerogatives uh, under, the, under, under the formal auspices of a legal arrangement um, delegitimized uh, uh, pre precisely the, the, the effort of creating uh, uh, those norms that would ultimately need, would need to prevail in order to have a peaceful world that ultimately broke down in the 1930s. So I was wondering if you could comment on, on that issue because it seems to me that that's something that, that Ho Chi Minh found so offensive, right? Uh, it's something that so many other uh, non-Europeans, right, and Mexicans found so offensive. The Koreans, right, the Koreans felt completely betrayed by the, by the, uh, by the, by the, by the League of Nations and by the, by the, by the treaty. So, um, I'm wondering if you could comment on that. This a delicate balance between power, uh, legitimacy, and legality, right, that seems to be very central here. Uh, Japan, through its entire uh, residency within the League of Nations to 1933 uh, believed that as long as the major powers were in control of the League of Nations, Japan would, would not be thwarted in its own regional expansionist goals. And a good example of this is uh, the, the, the Lytton Commission that was established in 1932, I think it was, to investigate the Manchurian crisis. Uh, Japan, as a member of the council, which set up that committee, insisted that all the representatives be from major nations. There were no representatives on, on the Lytton Commission from small nations. Japan was confident that colonial nations would understand and sympathize with Japan's goals in Manchuria. They miscalculated on that, uh, but uh, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the paradox. And power does pollute uh, the, the legalities. I can quickly add to that. I was struck um, when uh, Tom, in his presentation, mentioned the Holy Alliance. And something I skipped over when I uh, introduced the Declaration of the Chinese League of Nations Union. But when they uh, put out that document in February 1919, um, that exact phrase came up that um, the League of Nations unions around the world exist to ensure that popular opinion can monitor the League of Nations so that it doesn't become a uh, arbitrary unit that exercises the power of the strong powers and become something like the Holy Alliance. That was in the actual text. I didn't have it on my slide. Um, but then you kind of fall into, I think, a little bit of a loop because um, many of the activists in, for instance, in the Chinese League of Nations Union were legal scholars. They were trained in Europe or sometimes in Japan. Um, and they saw legality as a way for power, for increased power for China, for legitimacy for China uh, in the face of, of this. So they're sort of from that direction uh, as, as well. Um, obviously, you can just say, you know, as Japan did later on, to hell with the League of Nations, but that's not what a lot of people chose to do. They chose to work within that or choose, chose to you know, push on the, the question of, of um, legality. I think we have time for one more question. or. Yeah. Yes, this is just a question about um, Australia and Japan. Uh, so, uh, because I'm not sure it's come up at the conferences yet, but famously the Australian delegate to the League of Nations, Billy Hughes, wanted to argue against the inclusion of uh, racial discrimination, not act, but uh, you know, of, of legislating against ra uh, racial discrimination. Be partly because of the threat that Australians felt from Japan and largely because he believed in uh, a white Australia and, uh, and that, that uh, notion would threaten the whole sort of uh, idea of Australia. And, and so it was, I just wondered if you had anything to say about this famous episode between where Billy Hughes uh, argued against uh, um, uh, or in favor of, if you like, racial discrimination. Yeah, in relation I, to Japan. I think the, the Japanese historians of, of, of the Paris Peace Conference and the League would, would say, uh, was he Prime Minister? Yes. Prime Minister Hughes was, was the major factor in Japan's loss on the ra racial non-discrimination demand. Uh, and the British backed him, responded to him as one of the Dominions. So, uh, but that's, uh, that's another story. I didn't get into that, but, but it, it, 
it hit like a brick in Japan. I mean, the, the, uh, it just shattered Japanese public confidence in the league. They, they ended up joining the league, but with a lot more skepticism because of that. Right, time for one more. Oh. Uh, Paul Gardner, American University of Paris. Just a question, how did uh, the uh, Allied intervention in the, um, the, the Russians, Russia, Russia, impact uh, their view of, of the league? In other words, what were the, how did they see you at the real motives of the major powers if they were intervening in, 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 in Russia at that time, and doing so uh, illegally in the sense that it was never declared war? Just, just thought, it just came to me. I, I, I know you, nobody talked about it, but I just wanted to write it. Siberian intervention, 19, 1918. Yeah, uh, a comment. Uh, I, I see a major impact of that on uh, as contributing to Japan's post-war economic crisis. It was very costly, not not only in in uh, money but in blood. And uh, uh, Japan also occupied northern Sakhalin, and uh, uh, and it wasn't until the Washington Conference here. Yesterday, the, the significance of the Washington Conference was pointed out. I'd like to underscore that. Uh, it wasn't until the Washington Conference that Japan withdrew from Siberia, withdrew from northern Sakhalin, and restored the, the uh, leasehold of Qingdao to China. Uh, and, and there's an economic motivation. All those were costly escapades. And, and Japan was in deep recession. And this, of course, increased Japan's willingness to Agree to the 553 uh, minority naval relationship. In the so the Washington Conference kind of concludes all that, and that's where I see the significance of the Siberian intervention. Great. Thank you so much. We could have one more round of applause. For